I think we can uh, get started. Uh, so welcome, uh, everyone. I'm very happy to be here in this webinar hosted by PyMC Labs. Uh, I'm Tommy Capretto. I'm a data scientist at PyMC Labs. I've been working here for more than a couple of years. And today I have the pleasure uh, to be in this webinar with uh, Pavel Gnor and Matthew uh, Johnston, a CTO and CEO from uh, Epic Content. Um, welcome, guys. How are you? Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, Pavel, you want to go first? Yeah, OK, no problem. Hi, everyone. I'm Pavel Knorr, and I'm the CEO of Epic Conjoin. Today, uh, I probably will be mostly talking about uh, how we, we apply it, the Bayesian methods in our solution. But before we go into this interesting topic, let us uh, let Matt introduce himself. Thanks, Pavel. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with uh, Tommy and Pavel um, to talk about our solutions. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Epic Conjoint. Um, I guess up until maybe five or six years ago, I used to head up pricing departments in uh, big telecom companies around Europe and in the Middle East. Um, and when while I was in that last role, um, I spotted a gap in the market um, in terms of conjoint analysis. And we'll Pavel will explain more about what conjoint analysis is. But in very simple terms, we work with the world's biggest companies, typically big consumer good companies. Uh, so Mercedes, Shell, Vodafone, uh, Kraft Heinz, PepsiCo, these types of companies. And we help them, I guess, inject more predictability and success into their product, messaging, promotion, and pricing decisions. And how we do that is with a survey methodology called conjoint analysis. Um, and I'll, uh, we'll explain more what the what the what some conjoint is um, as we go through the call. Thank you, Pavel and Matthew. Uh, before starting with the presentation, uh, I would like to remind everyone that you can uh, leave uh, questions. Um, we are going to have a dedicated slot uh, for uh, questions uh, in the end of the conversation. Uh, but if in some part of the conversation I see a question that seems interesting for that moment, I'm just going to to throw the, the question so we can discuss uh, uh, about that. But feel free to ask, uh, to leave questions uh, whenever you want. Uh, and now, if you want, uh, Pavel, uh, you can start with your presentation. Yep, thank you. Let me start the slides. Yeah, okay, cool. So Matt already mentioned that uh, what is our typical client and what we're doing. We're not actually doing only the conjoint. We're also offering some other methodologies like MaxD, Kickback Ranger, One West and Orb, generic quant studies, so on. Uh, but I guess that's not the key point, yeah, because uh, there are other companies who do that. And uh, there are much bigger companies who do that. And uh, guys like McKinsey, Kantar, Bloomberg, they also like typically work with huge enterprises, world leading brands and uh, other type of companies like that and that size. However, there is a difference. Yeah, we're not competing with like McKinsey or Kantar directly because our one of our key features is the rapid insight. So we're not only allowing you to build a conjoint. We take your hand and walk you through the step by step from like designing the survey that will address your questions. Then we take care of the uh, survey distribution because finding the right people to ask them is a crucial one. We will talk about it in a, uh, later on during the presentation. And then um, we collect the results. We, 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 we collect the responses, calculate the results, and then uh, walk our client through some like analytics. So the, the beauty of this is that sometimes if client fast enough, we can do this within like a couple of days. And this is what you will never get with like guys like McKinsey because 
they 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 doing a very very comprehensive studies which usually takes months yeah epic trying to take the niche where we addressing a, one question at a time but we can do it within days and sometimes it's actually quite useful because just imagine yeah some countries have the uh, a very rapid inflation yeah hundred uh, percent per year like in Ukraine or in Turkey last year and just imagine if you have to wait three, four, five, six months to get the response from McKinsey. Of course, it will be brilliant in its quality and accuracy and everything else, but might be quite outdated by the time you get this insight. So this is one of our key features. Uh, Matt, do you want to add anything here? Yeah, no, just to emphasize, um, you know, our USP is speed, speed to market, but, but absolutely no sacrifice and the integrity of the results and then to that feed the insights these companies um need uh, use to make their decisions um and that's and that's why we work with uh partner with the uh, with PyMC labs um to help ensure that that we get that laser precision uh in terms of the results despite despite actually the speed at which we turn around these surveys um, so that's that's critical to our US, USP, and that's why we're picking up more and more big brands. Just yesterday, Coca Cola um, um, looked like they want to work with us. Um, so these these are the types of companies that um, you know they're they're they have multiple markets, and we can survey in hundred and over hundred and thirty kits and multiple products within those markets, and that's our sweet sweet spot from a target customer's perspective. Um, so the, that's the that's the USP and the proposition we deliver for them. Cool, thank you. So before we jump into the model, yeah, I probably need to very quickly uh, explain the mechanics of the conjoint. So in order to understand the model and how you can apply Bayesian methods here, uh, you need to like basically understand what conjoint look like. And uh, actually, here to the right, you already see the screenshot from our system. And uh, conjoint is the survey-based methodology for the market research that allow you to understand the importance of different attributes or features and how your potential buyers and our respondents value them. So um, what you see on the right is a typical study, uh, part of the study. We call it a chase card. And this chase card show you a single scenario that potentially can happen on the market of the healthy snack bars. You have three snack bars. You see that each snack bar, each product, yeah, consists of several discrete attributes. We call them features. Sometimes they are referred to as attributes. Uh, like that's that's literally the same. In our case, this is the brand, calorie per bar, sugar content, preform type of bar, protein content, and price. Price is, well, obviously quite typical for the conjoint studies. A lot of buyers want to, a lot of customers want to understand uh, pricing questions and first. And what you see here is that basically each bar in this scenario has the same features, calorie content per bar, sugar content, so on. Uh, but the different values of these features, these values call it levels. So each feature has levels, and levels are shared across the, um, and levels are different across the products. So usually when you start designing it, you like say, okay, so I have um, my um, snack bars market. Snack bars is defined in key parameters that should participate in the decision making process are sugar, brand, type, uh, calories, something like that. So you identify these features, then you identify the levels. Yeah, what is the sugar? My sugar content, I have three products that can be 17 grams, 5 grams, 9 grams. Then we have a competitors, and they can be 10 grams, 11 grams, 8 grams, so on. So you get a set of features. Each feature has a set of discrete levels. Basically speaking, speaking our words, it's like uh, very similar to the factor analysis. So we have factors. Each factor has the... Uh, discrete levels, and um, we are define them. Then we create a combinations of products, and from this combination of products, we form the uh, we form the chase cards. 
Typically, each respondent will see eight to 20 choice cards, and each choice card will contain, again, depending on design, market, and so on, two to five alternatives per card. And uh, um, this permutation that we show, yeah, so basically when we formulated the factors, we uh, formulated factors and their discrete levels, and then we're creating the uh, product alternatives and then forming these alternatives in the choice cards. It's not a random process, of course. And this is a huge and big aspect of conjoint analysis. In general, there are three factors, yeah, three big aspects. This is generation of these cards. Uh, this is called like design of experiment and experiment plan generation. It's not the topic of the uh, today's webinar. Uh, it's a big field, big research field, but um, there are no Bayesian factors here. It's more like uh, combinatorics and mass related. Uh, the main idea is that you need to generate this card in a way that you generate biggest variability, keeping the balance, and uh, um, guarantee that once you get an answer, you can build an effective regression model on top of that. So uh, this is how it works. Third factor about the conjoint analysis that we will also not be touching today is the results analysis. Yeah, how do you present the results? How you analyze them? How you build market simulator? Again, there are no Bayesian aspects here, and we are here today to talk only about the Bayesian modeling and PMC. So, uh, but that's actually three important steps of conjoint analysis. So it's generation of the effective design, then the regression analysis itself, and uh, results analysis and capturing the insight. So we will focus on the second one, where we are building the regression. So let's imagine uh, from this slide that we already have the data. They are correctly prepared, they balance it, and so on. Okay, so probably now we can talk about the underlying model, and that's where the interesting part starts. So as you may see before, yeah, these choice cards, they already might lead you to the high-level understanding of uh, how it will work. So it's choice experiment, yeah, and I select one of these alternatives, and then I have multiple choice cards, and everywhere I select one of the suggested alternatives. I can select none of these, but this is another, let's say, fake alternative or no alternative. Uh, we have a question. Okay, assuming conjoint analysis is a sample survey, how we can how can the results be extrapolated to the full market or different customer segmentation? Uh, the question from Sean. Sean, that's a brilliant question. The key point here is in making sure how uh, that we. Uh, sample the right people. Because besides the conjoint, usually you show a set of questions before the choice card, which are aiming to identify that you belong to the right audience. So usually uh, surveys are sampled through the uh, panel providers. Yeah, panel providers is the companies who connect you with the real people yeah, that participated in the online panels. So basically they're receiving the link to your study. And before seeing the chase cards, you see a set of questions that assures that you're in the right segment. So let's say this survey, yeah, it's about the snack bars, yeah? And uh, obviously, in order to get nice results, we need to only uh, survey the consumers of the uh, healthy snack bars, because otherwise, uh, they are not the target audience. They cannot judge about the prices. They will not form any useful insight. So it's literally will be the question like, do you uh, periodically or regularly buying the snack bars? And if you say no, you immediately screen it out. And uh, usually it can be 10, 15 different uh, screening questions yeah, to make sure that you are in the right sample, that you are the right respondent to uh, pass you through the conjoint study and uh, show, you the, show you the choice cards. And besides that, we also have quotas. So you can say that you can ask question about the age group or gender group, and then say that you want to have, I don't know, for the health bars, majority of uh, 60% in the age group of 18 to 35, 20% in 35 to 55, and so on. So basically, 
like survey mechanics allow us to get to the right people and make sure that the right people are in the right proportion before they see the choice card. And then this is the way how we can do the segmentation, how we can guarantee that, that the data is relevant, of course. Besides that, there is a, the whole underseen world of the different tricky behavior, respondents who are rushing through the survey, bots, and stuff like that. So that's, that's a whole another world. And uh, we at Epic will be happy to uh, talk about that in hours. But I guess today we will purely focus on how to analyze the data, assuming that the data is right, that they represent the um, correct purchase profile. Hope that I uh, answered your question, Sean. Uh, please let me know if uh, if uh, you will have a follow-up question. Okay, let's proceed. So, uh, okay, well, we stop it at the moment when I said that this is a chase model. Yeah, and for uh, those of you who are familiar with a very very typical uh, classical challenge of identifying iris species, yeah, this is sounds like oh, this is a softmax regression. Yeah, you need to classify to which class you belong, but this is not a classical categorical regression. Thomas, I, uh, I, uh, I, I think that you have some comments here, yeah? Yeah, uh, thank you, Pavel, and thanks for uh, the, the answer to, to the person that left the question. So this looks uh, very, very, very similar to a categorical regression because we have a linear predictor, which is a combination of some regression coefficients and some predictors. I'm talking about the betas and the x variables there. And then we have the softmax function, and we use that softmax function to estimate some probabilities. So it looks like a regular categorical regression. But this is not like categorical regression. Think about two things. What's the first uh, option uh, for the first individual? Let, let, let's think about the, the previous card that we saw. We have three options or four options because we, have, we also have uh, none of the previous. Um, the first option for the first individual may not be uh, the first option for the second individual. So in the computer, we will have, okay, we register a one here and then we we'll register another one in the other part. But that doesn't mean that they selected uh, the same answer or the same okay. choice because the choices are given by the values of uh, the attributes that are present in that choice. With that, I'm saying that if you show them the, the formula for the utility, uh, mm -hmm. for every uh, attribute we have, at least for now, this version, we have a single uh, coefficient. And with the regular categorical regression or multinomial regression, we have as many coefficients as levels of the response variable. We then need to make sure that those parameters can be identified and all that. That's another story. Uh, but that's one of the first differences. This looks like a categorical regression model, but it's not exactly like that. And the final thing I add to this is uh, I'm also one of the main developers of Bambi, which is a library that's built on top of PyMC, and we support the uh, categorical regressions, and it works uh, very well. But we don't support exactly this model because of that aspect uh, that I mentioned. So in this case, it's perfect to use uh, PyMC because of uh, the flexibility. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Thomas. Very, very uh, useful insight. So yeah, uh, just a few words about the utility. So uh, I will explain it to the audience, and they will understand the difference. I believe. So what is the utility? And yeah, in conjunction, they call it a part force utility usually. So what we say, we identify the product by its utility, and utility of the product is the sum of utilities with parts. So assume that we have this level, uh, Kellogg's Nutri-Grain, yeah? This is part of the product. 
So if we get some weight coefficient, part of utility of uh, this particular product level, then we can add the part of utility of the uh, 205 calories, then to uh, add 17 grams, then add gluten-free, diabetes-free, then add cereal bar, then add 5.6 protein, and uh, finally add the coefficient of the price, we get the utility. So the utility of product is equal to sum of utility of its prices. So when you look on this, when you look on this uh, formula, you actually have access is uh, your encoded levels. But you can use demi coding, you can use effects coding, you can use numerical coding where applicable yeah, for the numerical features. But uh, that doesn't matter. What's interesting is the betas. Yeah, betas is the coefficients that we're going to find using the regression model. And this is our utility. So U is the utility of a single product. And then the main regression looks like uh, it's very similar to the softmax. It looks exactly like a softmax on a glance. We tell that we have C is our choice cards. And the probability of alternative E being selected on the card equal to the exponent of that product utility divided by the sum of the exponents of all products. So basically, it's very simple because I either select pro uh, product number one or product number two or product number three or none of this, which is like a fake built up product, but still a product. So one of these four choices will be made. And this is one of our options here. So if you add the uh, probabilities for entire choice card, yeah, uh, then you will get uh, one as the result of this equation. So that's basically how it works. But what Thomas mentioning is that it is different because it's not a classification task. Yeah, getting back to the iris data set, very classical. I assume a lot of people are aware of that. In the iris data set, you have a separate coefficients for each type of iris. So there are three classes of iris. Yeah, that's a flower. There are three classes of iris, and for each you have a set of the coefficients. We have a single set of the coefficients, but still powering the single set of the coefficients into the multinominal logistic regression or like a soft max. Yeah, that's how it works. That's the interesting part. And yeah, Thomas is right. We, uh, <laughs> by the way, I didn't mention that, but we've tried it. We've, we've looked it into the Bambi uh, a couple of years ago and uh, didn't find a way to define this. Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting part. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, once we review with this uh, underlying model, let's talk uh, about the why it should be hierarchical. And actually, what we're saying here, we're not inventing the wheel, really, because there are plenty of markets who, uh, plenty of players on the market who do the conjoint. Yeah, there are like Softus, let's say, who was a godfather of the uh, conjoint analysis, particularly this choice basic conjoint analysis. And uh, of course, they, 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 they produce tons of educational materials and resources, very valuable. And uh, I believe the inventor of the uh, conjoint analysis, uh, McFadden and then Richard Johnson, uh, they they talk about uh, about Bayesian methods and uh, hierarchical regression as the only and the right way to building conjoint model. Why? Because again, the model is pretty simple, and uh, the model how it's defined right now you can do with a variety of different libraries. You can take the simplest one, plogit in R or stats models in Python and define this model. So it's quite simple on the glance, but you get the aggregated regression. So you've uh, surveyed 500 different people, yeah? And then aggregated all of them in a single set of the coefficients. It sounds like you will, uh, Mm -hmm. It sounds like the um, one set of the coefficients will not nicely explain the underlying processes. Just think about that. Some people like Coca-Cola, some people like Pepsi. Yeah. And if it appears that your survey among 500 respondents will have 250 Coca-Cola buyers and 250 of Pepsi buyers, 
then uh, you will summarize this a single regression and the coefficients will be like very similar to each other but and you will not see any difference because you just calculated one regression i believe there is a brilliant absolutely brilliant example in the pmc materials it's radon example yeah that's the measuring of level of radons in switzerland in different counties and uh, um, i don't know who written that article thomas probably uh, he goes down through this bullet model that do the aggregation and um, what is the alternative? Yeah, so let's say we don't want to explain 500 different people with a single set of the coefficients. What we can do? What is our real options here? Uh, actually, not a lot, because if you try to build a model, a separate model for each single respondent, the reality is that you only have 10 observations per respondent, sometimes 20, but usually it's 10. And you will not be able to converge regression with the many variables uh really many variables sometimes it can be eight features and level each and you will not be able to converge um, a separate model per respondent you will not have enough data obviously uh, so what we have right now if we do the average regression one single pooled regression for everybody we will not be able to spot the underlying processes and understand what is the groups and segments are playing uh, within our audience. If we do the uh, model, regression model per respondent, it will simply not converge. I mean, it, it, it will not work, unfortunately. So the only choice yeah, is the combination of those two, which is the hierarchical regression. And well, this is actually the place that leads us to the MCMC and uh, in the end of the day to the PIMC. In the conjoint world, that's around for a pretty long time. I believe at least from 90s when the modern computers became powerful enough to calculate uh, Markov chains using Monte Carlo method. Before that days, yeah, in 70s and 80s, conjoint was already around, but nobody was building the uh, MCMC. Everybody understood that you should do MCMC, but you don't have a power of all computers to do that. So uh, back in the days, it was mostly like either the average uh, regression or latent class, yeah. And once once the uh, computerization of the world reached to the certain level and the processor became powerful enough to do the MCMC even on the uh, average computer, it became like industry standard. So really, the all big players who do the conjoint to do the theoretical regression and evaluate the uh, average and derive the individuals from average, which is literally hierarchical regression here. Uh, Thomas, do you want to add anything here about hierarchical versus non-hierarchical? Um, you, you gave a, a great uh, explanation about that, but um, I would like to add a, a very small thing. Uh, so you can also do uh, hierarchical modeling or multi-level effects regressions or mixed effects regressions, whatever, in a non-Bayesian world. Um, and in many cases, it works. Um, however, this approach fits more naturally in the Bayesian world, because in the Bayesian world, we model all the parameters as random. Uh, so hyperparameters are just another parameter or another random variable. And so everything plays nicely, while when you do an approach based on maximum likelihood, you have fixed parameters and you have random parameters that you have to integrate out. Uh, I'm not saying that approach is not going to work. I'm saying that uh, the Bayesian approach is a better place for hierarchical models. And on top of that, when you have a, a mixed effects model uh, using uh, a non-Bayesian approach, for example, maximum likelihood, uh, it may happen that some of the estimations live in the boundary of the um, parameter space, and that's mm -hmm. usually problematic. Think of a standard deviation being estimated uh, equal to zero. Uh, if, you've, if you have used LME4 uh, in the past and you have seen some message about some 
matrix not uh, being positive definite, then this is what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, so in this case where we don't have too many data points, but we have many subjects, and we want to have multiple coefficients, one for every subject, the uh, hierarchical approach uh, is great, and the Bayesian approach is great for the hierarchical approach. So that's why you're very listening. natural, yeah, very I'm very seeing. natural. So it's like invented for, specifically for this, yeah. So and, yeah, and extremely I'm, extremely natural for that. I'm going to take a couple of just two, one minute to answer uh, the question uh, by sure. Sean. It's saying thanks for your answer. Seems like your conjoint choice model is not based on Bambi. Curious the connection with PIMC Bayesian method with your approach. I'm not completely sure I understand the, the question, but I'm going to answer what I understand the question is about. Uh, the model is not based on Bambi. That's correct. But every Bambi model under the hood is a PIMC model. So whatever you can do with Bambi can also be done with PIMC. Why I like it is because it's in many, many cases easier. But then the class of models that you can create with PIMC uh, is much wider than what you can make with, with Bambi. Uh, Bambi is pretty flexible. We uh, uh, allow for a very wide class of models. But with PIMC, you have a probabilistic programming language. You can do basically whatever you want. Uh, feel free to leave another question if this is not properly answered. Uh, and OK, let's go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, to summarize, yeah, about the hierarchical model, that's the example of how the uh, G-graph might look like. Yeah, that study was about, so mu is our uh, variables that represent the um, average values of the coefficient, so higher level of the regression. Betas is in the individual level of the regression. And uh, you can see that we, so this is example from one of our test studies. Yeah, let's say we had 15 predictors, and then these 15 predictors we had for the 440 different respondents. And if you have a look, yeah, in the end of the day, when we have a choice, it's 6,600 observations. So not a big amount. And uh, that was relatively small survey, to be honest with you. But um, I mean, even when we go beyond this, when we have more respondents, when we have more features, more predictors, yeah, uh, then then it's still like, obviously the, the scale of the data grows, but it's still totally manageable. And I guess we will talk about the performance and speed in a minute, but it's quite manageable. So no big surprises if you do it right. Yeah, I will get back to this shortly. And uh, then we sampling betas. And this is, for example, the betas of a single individual. So. Let's say this respondent was John, yeah? And we have his uh, betas, and we will see how, well, we see the burnout on the right, and then we have his uh, betas that represents uh, that John allocates different values, yeah? In the center of his normal distributions, posterior distributions are very different for a different feature. That's, uh, by the way, uh, yeah, looking on that, you can, you can start talking on the quality of the data. That's another very interesting object that's not so obvious, but mm, it is nice when you see variability here. Because if you're dealing with the bots, they very often able to like produce the samples, posterior posterior distributions that are like exactly almost the same. Yeah. And uh, so when you see individual betas that looks different, you're like, oh that's good. Yeah, that's good. When you see the posterior betas that among different respondents are almost identical, they're like, oh, probably we're dealing with the bot farm. And they becoming, believe you or not, they becoming tremendously smart. So they become smarter and smarter and smarter. And this is never ending uh, mouse and cat chasing. Yeah. Like we introducing chat GPT to qualify and rate the quality of the freeform text answer. So to like, let's say, we ask a freeform text to make sure that respondent understand and care about the subject, yeah? And then we use ChatGPT to get rid of uh, 
answers who generated by bots. Yeah, like hello beer twenty two. It's not the answer. So goodbye. But then they will start using ChatGPT to generate meaningful answers. Yeah, to that. So it's it's never ending chase. But yeah, we don't cover best. But this is almost the same important as the quality of the model, because if you have bad data in the income, yeah, you will have bad results. Shit in, shit out, as we usually say that. And that's that's the crucial part. Without right data, or your model, no matter how sophisticated it is, no matter how good is your reporting tools, if you get the right data in in, in into, then you will end up with a pretty bad outcome. That's that's the reality. Okay, uh, what I probably want to highlight here, uh, yeah. So, uh, I guess one of the questions that we wanted to discuss today, yeah, is why we have chosen IMC, and there are technical and non-technical aspects into that. Why better to do with IMC? And believe me, I'm actually started developing this model with nearly zero knowledge of the. Uh, Bayesian methods, yeah, and had to like complete this journey from scratch. And we had different models, yeah. So we started with our first version, yeah, our MVP. We are startup, yeah. So our MVP was not hierarchical, yeah. And then we move it to the hierarchical, and we explore it dozens of different tools, like literally. So we've tried it with different air solutions, solutions in our, we have looked into the TensorFlow probability framework. We have uh, uh, actually checked it Bambi. Yeah, we have uh, checked at the, what is the name? Turing and Julia. Julia is the language, Turing is the framework yes, for, yes, building, yes. for building this model. Uh, we have even looked on the STEM. Well, STEM, STEM, STEM is very powerful, but um, hard to jump into, yeah. R, R is tricky. Yeah, you have a very nice tools in R, but what is the problem? Nobody actually talk about that, but there is a big problem with R because like 100% of R libraries or 99% of R libraries are licensed under GPA. And you not always want to have a GPL in your code because I mean, GPL is kind of the virus license. So uh, potentially you want, you might get the, outcomes and, and legal considerations that you don't want to get. So R for production use, it will work, yeah, but there is always a legal aspect and the integration aspect, to be honest, yeah. So integration aspect in the R is also uh, could not be could not be omitted because, I mean, it's cool when you have the uh, environment, you can build your models automatically, like an AWS SageMaker. That's good. They have like pre-built images and containers with R, with TensorFlow, and so on. So you can do it like pretty much fast. But there is a local development, there is a testing environments, and you don't want this homogeneity. Yeah, you generally don't want your developers to maintain uh, R. If your main our main project is in Python, yeah. So Pythonic tools are more favorable because it's a single stack. It's much easier to integrate. It's much easier to uh, maintain. It's much easier to deal with the hardware questions uh, through Python than you do it through R and so on. So could try to like use R libraries in the commercial project should understand me. Of course, when you using the Jupyter notebook or you are using the R Studio and just execute the scripts. Uh, you 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 like a typical data scientist, yeah. So you explore the data in the real life. You uh, your main tools will be R or Jupyter plus Anaconda, and that's totally fine, yeah. But when you try to integrate this and make this automatic, make this automatic. So survey is like survey is connected with online panel provider. So it's automatically capturing the responses. It's automatically close. Once we reach the required number of respondents, it's automatically start model building. It's automatically release the model results. Yeah. So everything should be automatic. And uh, the easiness and cost of the integration when you have Python is obviously will be lower than any R solution. And that's that's a good part. That's a good part. Uh, license is another important topic. And finally, a support. So like, 
Well, definitely there are forums publicly available uh, where you can like reach community of different art developers who might help you. However, it's not really comparable to the uh, support forums of IMC because, I mean, I was able to communicate through support forums of PyMC with authors on PyMC, yeah, and get like precise answer to my questions. But uh, I tried to connect with different authors of our libraries at least three times. Every time I had to do this via email, and like zero times I get the response. So it's not like you uh, not getting any help. But I mean, in case you need to reach authors. For our libraries, typically, it might be quite complicated, unfortunately. That's my personal experience. Perhaps it's not like applicable to the all majority of our libraries, and there are definitely like thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. But um, in our journey, yeah, the experience of getting support with PyM from PyMC community and getting uh, support from, let's like, say, by some community or or other libraries, that's a different story, to be honest with you. So support, license, integration, that's probably uh, topics I wanted to cover. And then there is another technical aspect of that. Yeah, uh, Another technical aspect is to have a look on the effectiveness of your model. Because uh, we at Epic managed to, like, get the model that is working in the way we want yeah but then we reach it to pymc labs yeah and thomas find different ways how we can make it faster more efficient and faster because time is a big consideration yeah uh, at the beginning we had a um, parameterization issue not maybe problem but uh let's say performance problem related to the centered versus non-centered parameterization, yeah? And uh, some calculation could took hours, like 12 hours easily, 18 hours. That's a pretty long time, yeah? And uh, sometimes it even can punch you when you say that you're time effective and very speed, yeah? And then wait like 15 hours to get the uh, regression, um, regression ready. Yeah, so this will was one of the steps which uh, right parameterization give us the significantly higher speed. Yeah, but then there is a, a, a the whole world of other features how you can make it more effectively, and then we get from like eighteen hours to two hours, and then uh, Thomas look at another model and define it priors more effectively and define it just a computational graph more effectively. So on the glance, it's the same model definition, but organize it in the more efficient way. So the initial compilation time of the computational graph faster and uh, it do less operation, so it works faster, yeah? And that's what uh, we get from PyMC Labs, which is, I mean, just fantastic because if you try to do it from scratch, yeah, and you're not improving that, it can take not months, but years to master to that level of understanding. And uh, this is, uh, I would say, one of the very important value propositions for time slops because they can jump in, understand the model, and then like turn the finite model into the model that works 20% faster. And it remains the same model, but like define it in the better way. Thomas, I, I believe you have some like thoughts yeah, and comments yeah. on that, yeah, about yeah. the effectiveness of use. Yeah, thank you for uh, the nice words. Uh, I think you you covered it. I'm just going to men to mention a couple of things again uh, to put more emphasis on it. Uh, when you're working with these kind of models, where you have a probability as an outcome somewhere, and you're using some kind of single sigma mode like function. Uh, you have to pay attention to the priors that you use. Uh, you shouldn't go and say, oh, I'm going to use a very wide prior, so I'm going to put a normal prior with a standard deviation of 100, because in the space of a probability, that's actually very informative. It's either very close to zero or either very close to one. And mm -hmm. in, in many cases, uh, things are going to work well in the sense that you're going to get a posterior that makes sense. 
if you have uh, data that allows you to do that. But first, in other in some cases, that doesn't happen, especially if you don't have a lot of data. And usually, you pay a price in computation time. Uh, if you have uh, very informative priors that are informative in a bad way, uh, you can pay a, a price in computation time. So that's one thing um, I wanted to mention. And the other thing about the implementation, it's uh, good to know what uh, how PIMC works uh, internally. So just as, as a piece of advice, if you find yourself uh, writing many for loops within a PIMC model and doing weird things with the distributions that you create within that for loop, uh, in many cases, you're going to get uh, the right model. It's going to work. Uh, that's OK. But if you find a way to write that model, that same model, using uh, multidimensional distributions, then that's usually faster. And on top yeah. of that, uh, something that you can use, and it has been available for a long time. Uh, well, a long time in this world is a couple of years, <laughs> that's, or a very long time. <laughs> uh, you can define your model in PyMC, and you can use samplers based on JAX, uh, because we compile to black JAX or to non-pyro, and that usually speeds up uh, models. And for those who want to experiment a little bit more, uh, there is NotPy uh, that was written by Adrian Sabold, one of the lead scientists at PyMC Labs. Uh, NotPy is written in Rust. It's a, a Nut sampler written in Rust with some new adaptation uh, routine, which is also working uh, very, very well. But I'm given the I'm mentioning it for those who like to experiment because, well, depends on your setup, but you need to be, you have to be able to run Rust uh, on your computer and having okay. an environment with the re required dependencies is not uh, it's, it's easy. But well, we are working to make that uh, easier and available to to everyone. Um, Pavel, uh, I don't know. It's uh, ten minutes until the the end of the of the webinar. We can stay a little bit more if we if we want. Uh, oh, thank you. I guess uh, I covered want... all the topics just in just in the right time. So <laughs> yeah, I I mentioned it about the model. I mentioned it about the like tips and tricks. Yeah, what was the problem? Sometimes yeah, as I said, they are not technical. Sometimes they are related to the licenses. Sometimes they are related to the support. Yeah, mm -hmm. and sometimes you really value the effectiveness. Yeah, because like, you know how the PIMC works internally and you definitely like, in, so we are commercial devs. Our team is a commercial devs and we're mostly writing in empirical code. We're taking data from database, putting data into database, like do some analysis, but still, yeah, that's not our day-to-day -day job. And when you want to uh, configure the PIMC model, with a multi-dimensional distribution, it's not that easy how, like, Tommy say that. I mean, it, it sounds easy. It looks easy and elegant, by the way, in the code. So when you see this, it sounds, it sound, it, it looks nice, but it's quite hard to, to think of that category. So you need, you need to be trained for that. And uh, so, that's okay. That, that has the additional value, I guess you provide. Yeah, I, I was about to move to the Q&A part. So if you have any questions, please feel free to leave questions here. Um, and my, my question for you was about uh, what were the, the pros and the cons of uh, working with PyMC? And I guess that what you are saying about okay, these multidimensional distributions, it was, it was not the most intuitive thing in the very beginning, correct? So how I will formulate that? Uh, I I probably could uh, say only good words about the PIMC because I'm like I'm personally try it in Julia uh, TensorFlow. I personally try it different R libraries. So the PIMC, like just Python is my main development language. It provides the most convenient experience, the be best experience I, I've tried. That's that's my personal experience. However, you know what about the multi-dimensional distribution? I didn't thought of them at all. So like 
I defined it my model, it works. Then we were able to get from the centered to non-centered parameterization, uh, which makes everything work fast. So I was not thinking about the multidimensional distribution until you show me them. <laughs> yeah. And then, mm -hmm. then, yeah, it's like speed up the model by another 15%, which is great. Yeah. So because it's very correlates with our statements about the speed, because now we don't wait even two hours. We can get the majority of the models done in one half hour, yeah, which is which is great and sometimes makes a difference because that's what we experienced a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so mm -hmm. clients have the end of the financial year and they have some budget to spend. So like then some Friday evening you receive the notification that result needs to be done very quickly. Yeah, and uh, that's a big difference. Yeah, so this one hour and two hours starts to play a difference in your operations. Yeah. Great. Um, good. Uh, I don't see any questions so far. So please, if you have any questions, feel free to, to drop questions in the Q&A uh, section. Uh, yeah, we, we, we didn't make any emphasis on, on the times uh, and, and all that. Uh, but with, uh, from experience in this project, we are talking about uh, in the order of minutes of maybe with some larger data sets, uh, some few hours or close to an hour of model feeding, which for a complex basin model uh, is quite good. That's a good result. Uh, That's a good result. A good result. I have worked in projects where we had to wait for 25 hours <laughs> until the sampler finished. Uh, so 10 minutes is great to me. Like, uh, let me say, the, our typical model, our typical survey, takes about an hour, which is a great one. And uh, we have some questions. Uh, probably, Thomas, you can you can yeah. adjust them. I, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the first question is from uh, Adevario uh, Adehari. It says, "What's the best way to to select random parameters?" I think you're talking about what's the best way to select priors. Uh, so please let me know if that's not correct. Um, what When you select priors, first you have to think about the meaning of the parameters that you're putting a prior on. Uh, you have to consider whether you have uh, link functions in, in your model. The first thing we learn is linear regression. So we just have parameters, we add them up, and that's the, what well, we multiply them by the variables, we add them up and we get uh, an estimation of the mean. But when you, uh, when you don't have, sorry, when you do have a non-identity link function that transforms that linear predictor into something else, then that becomes trickier. And that happens in, in, in this model because we have the utility and then we transform the utility. So the best thing or one of the things you can do is you can uh, perform a prior predictive checks. You can just sample from the prior and you can see two things, how that the priors affect some parameter of interest, which in this case can be the probability of the different options. And when, you, when it makes sense to generate uh, prior predictive distributions, you can have a look at the prior predictive distribution as well. So you can see the impact of the priors on the values of the response uh, variable. And it usually happens when you have, let's say, a plain logistic regression um, with only one predictor. Uh, I, I'm not sure if there's a time sync sample about that, but if you put a prior, a normal prior with a standard deviation of 100, thinking it is uninformative, then you, when you do uh, the inverse of the logit of that parameter, you're going to get all the values concentrated in zero or one, which is very informative and you don't want that. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, um, cons basically uh, take into account the meaning of the parameters, uh, consider, think twice when you have a link function and perform prior predictive checks. Um, then another question is... Yeah, 
I can answer. Do you want that. to add anything? Anim- okay. Yeah, yeah, I will answer the second one. So, Anonymous attendee asking, can we provide a simplistic sample notebook that lay out the conjoint workflow with PyMC? Unfortunately, I have to say no, because in the end of the day, we are a commercial project. So, yeah, we don't really want to expose uh, our final results uh, publicly. Uh, so, that, that probably would be the answer. What I can say is that there are ready to use solutions in R. Yeah, and you can try to map this uh, R's ready to use solutions into the uh, PyMC or try and experiment with other methodologies. But yeah, unfortunately, we, we cannot really um, just like release release that part of our uh, platform. So yeah, sorry. I want to add something to that, especially if the person asking is open to, to read some R code. I don't know if you know um, a person called Andrew Heiss. He's a professor in the US, I think, and he has a pretty nice blog. And he has been blogging about conjoint analysis in R. He's using BRMS and other frequencies tools. Uh, if you want to uh, have a look at that, I'm sharing one of the posts uh, here. It's, I'm pretty sure that not... I saw in in the inter- sorry for interrupting you. Uh, I'm pretty sure that yeah. I saw you know, over the internet a publicly available uh, chase based conjoint models based with the uh, BiSEM library. So you can R library. You can you can check them and uh, yes. perhaps in, if for academia it should work. In that uh, not in that blog, you will also find references to other uh, libraries in R, and they have examples and and all that. But, well, that's what's nice about the unique uh, work at uh, Epic Content that none of the models that I've seen uh, out there in those blog posts or guides are like the model that they have. So uh, they have a pretty unique thing, and that's uh, that's nice. Uh, we have another question, I think. Uh, uh, can we share the presentation? Is, uh, I mean, the video is going to be posted uh, online uh, on our YouTube channel. So I think that's enough. But if if you want to share it, Pavel, uh, it's uh, up, up to you. The content of the presentation will be available together with the webinar. So you will have everything. So I guess if it will be public uh, published to the video, then uh, I can leave the link to the presentation in the, this yeah. video, in that video. No problem. OK, yeah. good. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Cool. Any other questions? It seems that we don't have uh, any other questions. Just just in time. Uh, wonderful. <laughs> so uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, uh, Pavel. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, this is more a personal note, but it was a pleasure. Uh, to work with you. Uh, I want to say publicly that the model that we received was very well documented, and that doesn't always happen. So uh, that was a great thing. So when we had to look into the model, we already had a lot of the answers uh, in the in their documentation. So thank you for doing that. It was great. And thank you again uh, to anyone who, to, to everyone, sorry, uh, who joined. It was a pleasure to be here, and um, if you want to see the, if you want to see this conversation again, it will be posted on our YouTube, and you can also leave questions uh, there. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Bye Thomas. Bye. The uh, I could say the same. So the 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 flow of cooperation with PyMC Labs was just fantastic, very effective, very fast. Actually, that what we didn't mention it, but guys uh, helped us to review, clarify, and improve our models within like several weeks. So we just, we just absolutely great. And yeah, so Thomas, thank you very much. Thank you to PyMC Labs. And thank you for hosting this webinar and having us today. That's a pleasure as well. Yes, thank you. Matt? Yep, very enjoyable. Yeah, looking forward to uh, continued uh, collaborations with uh, PyMC Labs as, um, as our business evolves. Um, yeah, we have some ideas how to make move it to the next step in the future. So probably we will 
uh, get back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, right. attendees, if somebody needs conjoint, you can reach Epic Conjoint, and we will try to help you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sean, for Thank the you. nice Thanks. message, everyone. Take care.